Good evening, and welcome to Shh Productions Vintage Radio Hour, our collaboration with 30 performers from across the country, an outstanding production staff, and the legacy of audio entertainment that harkens back to the golden days of radio, will bring you 12 shows filled with suspense, mystery, fear, and maybe a little murder. The upcoming show, The Evening and the Morning, originally airing in 1948 and written by Willis Cooper, features Wolf Sherrill, Phil Wells, and Kim Garrison Hopcraft in a haunting story about unrequited love and murder. Stay tuned after the show for the second part of our doubleheader, Don't Tell Me About Halloween, starting at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Now, They're all gone now, aren't they? That was the last car going out of the gate, wasn't it? There's nobody there but the grave diggers. Can we walk over there for a minute, please? It's getting dark, isn't it? Is that what's bothering you? There isn't anything to be afraid of here that'll hurt you. My grandfather always taught me not to be afraid of cemeteries. They're sad places, he always said. They're sad, and they're lonesome. But there's nothing there to harm you. I'll only be a minute, really. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to break down or anything like that. It's, there's something I have to do. <laughs> no, I won't run away. You're not worried about that, are you? Well, after all, you've got a gun. You could shoot me if I tried to run away. I couldn't very well attack you suddenly, could I? Not with these handcuffs. Of course not. So let's walk over there for just a minute, please. Don't you think you are overdoing it a little bit, Dean? Well, I'm sorry if you think so. Yeah, I do think so. Please, may we walk over to the grave? Listen here, you don't have to impress me, you know. I was good enough to bring you out here and take the responsibility for you. And I'm grateful for you for that, Mr. Thorpe. You know, if some of her friends had seen you here, you'd have stood a good chance of getting lynched. I know that. I was sympathetic and I listened to you. It was against my better judgment that I brought you out here. I'm more than grateful, Mr. Thorpe. If I could have come out here alone, I would have. Yeah. We haven't started letting confessed murderers run around loose yet, especially to attend the funerals of the people they've killed. May we walk over to the grave, please? Uh, come on. Thank you. You're not doing yourself any good this way, Dean. I'm not trying to, Mr. Thorpe. What do you want to see the grave for? How can you stand looking at it? Haven't you got any heart at all? I killed her, didn't I? They won't have any trouble hanging you for it. I expect that. What do you want, then? Why do you... This isn't easy, Mr. Thorpe. It was hard enough doing what I did. And coming out here, well, it has to be done. I don't know what you're talking about. I... I loved Alice, Mr. Thorpe. You did? I did. And you murdered her. Here, where are you going? A flower, that's all. I want a flower from her grave. Put that back. No. No, I won't put it back, Mr. Thorpe. I tell you. No, please, don't ask me to put it back. This, this is a very precious thing, this flower. What are you talking about? My, this, this is why I murdered Alice, Mr. Thorpe. It's 
very good of you to walk back with me instead of writing. Truly a great favor, Mr. Thorpe. And I might as well tell you it's, well, I would have insisted on walking if you hadn't agreed so readily. It's just that, you see, if you hadn't consented, I'd have just stayed there. And it would have been awkward for you because well, I think I'm stronger than you and I would have resisted you. I don't believe you would have used your gun. Even if you had threatened me, I wouldn't have moved. So I'm very grateful to you because it's important for me to walk back. It's the last walk in the open air you're likely to have. Yes, I suppose it is. You're a strange character, Dean. You're rather unusual yourself, sir. Walking peacefully down a dark road with a murderer all alone. You may not have noticed, but I've got a hand in my coat pocket. So you have? And in my coat pocket is a gun. Of course. So let's not get any ideas because I've been stupid enough to humor you a little. I have no intention of trying to escape. Thank you. Did you ever walk along the cemetery road before? No. I have. I know every inch of it. Morbid. No. First time was with Alice. The woman you killed? Yes. I walked back with her from her husband's funeral a year ago. So now you're walking back from hers. Did you kill him too? <laughs> no. Don't you remember? He was killed in a motor accident. Oh, uh, yeah. Francis. That was his name. Francis. Yes. Were you uh, in love with Alice then? I think I've always been in love with Alice. I see. But Alice loved Francis. I begin to see a motive now. Motive? For murdering her. She was still in love with her husband. She wouldn't leave you, so you killed her. No. What? No, that wasn't my motive. What was then? I remember walking along the same road, Alice and I, a year ago. Just a year ago, day before yesterday. It was the same kind of evening, too. Cold and misty, threatening snow, like it is now. We'd stay there at the cemetery after everybody else had gone, Alice and I. And now we were coming back home. Francis would have liked the flowers, wouldn't he, Dean? Yes. So many, many flowers. Such beautiful ones. So bright, lovely. And the cold rain on them. Pretty soon the snow. Alice. Francis. And the flowers. All alone. Dean, let's go back for a little while, can't we? No, no, we mustn't do that, Alice. It's just... It's just come to me, Dean. I'm all alone. I, I, all this time I thought, I mean, I couldn't help thinking that it was some ghastly joke. That Francis isn't really dead. It's, it's a dream, maybe. And now, oh, Dean, he is dead. And I'm alone. Yes, dear. Don't. We've got to face it, you. Francis. Francis is dead. All I've got left is a flower from his grave. Willis, you're not alone. I'm, well, I know I'm not. I, but you're not alone while I'm, Alice, you're not alone. Look, Dean, the little yellow flower, the little yellow moss rose that Francis always loved so much. He was born. And he lived, and he loved me, and I loved him, and, and now there's nothing left but this. Alice, will you listen to me? Alice, will you stop this? It's no good carrying home a flower from, from there. Why, it's just a little symbol that'll break your heart all over again every time you look at it. But, but it was no, from his... No, don't say it. Don't carry home any reminders from that place, dear. I know this is hard. But now is the time for you to make decisions now and not years from now when you should be forgetting. That little rose, it'll always remind you. It'll always 
hurt you. It'll do terrible things to you, Alice. Throw it away. Throw away Francis's flower? It isn't his flower, Alice. But, but I need something to remind me. You don't need anything to remind you of Francis, Alice. You have your memories of five years of being married to him. You have all the things he wrote, the music he loved. You have so many precious memories, dear. You're going to trade them all for a, a memory of a mound of flowers on a November day in the rain? I, I remember Francis when he came home from the war. In the day you were married, I remember. He was so tall. I remember both of you. And the time we went to Canada, and it snowed. You remember Francis, not the flower. And the springtime in the country with him. And the times that he helped me wash the dishes. Throw the flower away, Alice. Here, Dean. You throw it away for me. I want to, but I'm afraid. Throw it away, Dean. And let me keep Francis in my heart. There's an old elm tree past the road. The biggest old elm tree you ever saw. We'll be walking past it in a few minutes, and I'll show it to you, Mr. Thorpe. You certainly talk as if you loved that woman, Dean. I did love her. I do love her. Well, why did you kill her then? Because I loved her. <laughs> and because she loved Francis. I said that was it. No, you're right in what you said, but you're forming the wrong conclusions, Mr. Thorpe. How? You think that I murdered her in a fit of anger because she refused to marry me. Of course. Well, that isn't true. I don't understand you. I'll explain it all to you. It doesn't need much explaining to me. I'll explain it. Well, what happened? Did your idea about throwing away the flower work? Yes, of course. But you're carrying away a flower from her grave. Yes. Why? Perhaps I want my memories of Alice to be that grave out there in the rain. Adding to your own punishment. Yes, that's part of it. I realize that I must pay a price for what I've done. I do that gladly, and I mean that. I mean, I'm really glad to pay it. But, well, I hope you will believe me. I want to punish myself even more. But I haven't finished. I've got one more thing to do. That's why I begged you to let me come to the funeral and why I plucked the flower from her grave. You're over my head, Dean. Bear with me, Mr. Thorpe. If you, it's only a little while. Ah, there. That, that's the big elm tree I told you about. You see it? There's a little street light just beyond it. What about it? There's a bus stop just beyond it. We. We can wait there for a bus if you like. Yeah, I see somebody waiting there now. I think it's a good idea. I'm tired. I wish you'd tell me, though, why you did do it, Dean. Not that it'll make any difference. Not with your confession and all that. Mr. Thorpe, are you superstitious? Me? No, it's nonsense. No, it isn't nonsense. A great many superstitions are founded on fact. A great many. I don't believe in ghosts, if that's what you mean. You know, Francis was a writer. Yeah. A writer of supernatural stories. I didn't know that. He had a very fair understanding of superstitions, beliefs, and all kinds. He had a large library of source material on that subject. Did he believe in ghosts? He was a rational man, Mr. Thorpe, and my very good friend. All right. I saw a good deal of Alice in the years since Francis was killed. In the first few months, when she was having to reconstruct her life, when she was having to reconcile herself to the fact that she was alone, that with Francis was gone out of her world, I spent a good deal of time with her. And I was gratified that she was taking it very well. She did the house over completely, with the exception of the room he'd used for a study. That she left exactly as he'd left it. Typewriter, stack of paper, 
the pottery jar full of sharpened pencils, half a pack of cigarettes, and a torn match package. Even the waste basket, crap full of torn sheets of paper, exactly the way he'd left it. That, she said, was to be her living memory of Francis. And always when I came to visit her, we sat in Francis's study. The talk was mostly of him. His publisher is called today. Wondered about the book he was working on. What about it? I told them it wouldn't be finished. He only had a few pages to go, as I remember it. It won't be finished. I don't think you ought to do that, Alice. I want it that way, Dean. Do you still feel... I mean... I'm very glad that you made me throw away that flower, if that's what you mean. It was an ugly thing, bringing it away from there. Yes. I'm very content now. It's been hard to make myself realize that. You know, it's, it's not really so bad when there are people around, but at night, alone by myself, I... <laughs> well, I think I've cried myself out, Dean. I'm glad you're... Oh, you've been an angel. Well... You have. Well, you see, Alice, I love you. I know you do. I... Well, that's all I can say, Alice. I love you. It's, uh, it's a horrible thing to have to say to the widow of my best friend, but... Widow? Well, Alice... W widow, you said... But Alice... You, you called me his widow? I'm not. I'm not. Stop. No, no, no. You get away from me. I'm not his widow. Do you hear me? I'm Francis's wife. Where's that fellow that was waiting for the bus? Did he go away? Did you see him? Yes. I saw him. So, she did get mad at you, huh? Um, well, don't you think you were rushing things a little, Dean? Don't you think you should have waited a little longer before you put in a word for yourself with his widow? His wife? No, Mr. Thorpe. I always knew Alice would never marry me. I knew too much of the deep love and affection that existed between those two. And I knew that I could never have a chance with her. But in, in all honesty, I couldn't help confessing to her. She said she knew how you felt. Yes, she did. Well, I don't see why this story is getting us, Dean. And besides, here's your tree. I'm going to sit down and wait for a bus. I wonder where that other fellow went. Francis loved music, although he couldn't play a note. Alice, in the old days, would sit at the piano nights when he found himself struggling with an old idea that wouldn't come out. Francis always said that if he could listen to Alice playing long enough, the, the toughest situation would unravel itself. I think that was a fact. Many a night, I've sat in the living room listening to her at the piano while Francis listened from his study. I remember one thing he used to love. Alice played it so often for him. People used to laugh and call it their theme song. Hmm. One night, not very long ago, I dropped in to see Alice. After a while, she sat down at the piano and played it. We hadn't heard it for so long. Long time since I played that, isn't it, Dean? It still sounds wonderful to me. I felt so lonesome tonight. It's an unpleasant night. Like it was a year ago, out there I'm in the... I'm not going to think of that. I can't help it, Dean. Play something else. No. <laughs> oh, I, I wonder if Francis is lonesome, too. Alice. No, I've been dreaming about him, Dean. Well, I suppose that's natural. He's always trying to tell me something. It's, it's so vague, but he's, he's lost, and he wants me so. 
You're morbid tonight. No, no, no. I'm not, Dean. I, I thought I was getting over missing Francis Dean, but I'll never get over it. I will never forget him. I can't forget. You must forget him, dear. No, I won't forget him. He's my husband. I love him. I love him. Alice, dear, you mustn't. No, Dean. I want him so. You, you've never lost anyone, Dean. You don't know how it is. And now, these last few weeks, I don't, I don't know how Francis lost me. You're not being rational, Alice. But I love him, Dean. Dean, isn't there some way? No, Alice. Well, I mean it. Dean, listen. Well? Francis, he had so many books. Wouldn't there be something in one of them that might tell me how to bring Francis back to me? Alice. Or some way that I could find him, Dean. Alice, sit down and stop this. Dean. Well? Dean, do you love me? You know I do. I will never marry you. Well, I, I hope that someday... No, it's a sacrilege to think even. I'm Francis's wife. I'll, I'll be Francis's wife forever, forever and ever. Darling, I... Wait. Dean... As surely as I'm sitting here, I swear to you, I will always love Francis. Yes. And I, I can't live without him. What do you mean by that? I've thought about it. I've thought about it until my head hurts. And you think I'm losing my mind, don't you? No. Dean, I won't. Marry you. Yes, you said that. But do you want to earn my everlasting gratitude and Francis's gratitude too? I don't understand you. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I won't do it. Dean, listen. If I kill myself, that would be a sin, wouldn't it? Yes. And I won't go to heaven and be with Francis, will I? No. Then you will do it. Alice, you've lost your mind. No. I... You said you loved me. Then prove it. Give me back to Francis. That's a great story, Dean. That is a great story. Yes, it is, isn't it? It's not the story you told when they arrested you. No. So you shot her because she asked you to? No. What do you mean? I went away from the house that night. I was very disturbed. Sleep. No, I couldn't sleep. About three in the morning, I telephoned her. We talked for a long time. She was much calmer. She agreed that she'd been very foolish, and we'd talk it all over again later in the day. I took two bromides and slept till noon. And then, in the afternoon, she telephoned me, woke me up. Come over right away, she said. Come over now, hurry. When I came in, she was holding a book. She seemed perfectly calm, but had obviously been crying for a long time. She was exhausted. What's happened, Alice? I asked. What's the matter? Sit down, Dean. What is it? What's that book? It's one of Francis's books from his reference library. Oh? Dean, when you left last night, I, I got to thinking some more about what I'd said first. That maybe there was something in one of Francis's books that would tell me how to bring us together again. Alice, I thought that we... Still. I went in there. And I looked at a lot of books. Some of them I couldn't understand, but I found one. I found this one. What is it? Dean, you murdered Francis. I what? You murdered 
his soul. Alice, what are you talking about? Do you remember the flower from his grave? Why, yes. Yes, of course. Look at the book. Dictionary of Superstitions and Mythology, Bonergie, Paris, 1927. Well, what about it? Page 101. I've marked it. Read it. Flowers. If a flower be plucked from the grave, then afterwards thrown away, the place where the flower falls will be haunted. Alice, what is this? It's true, Dean. It's superstition, for heaven's sake. It's true. Oh, now come now. It's true. How do you know? Because I went out to the cemetery road. I went to the elm tree where you threw the flower away almost a year ago. When did you go out there? This morning, while it was still dark. This morning? And it's true. I know. Francis is there, chained to that spot forever and ever. Oh, Dean, what are we going to do? We did it, you and I. What are we going to do? And what did you do? I... I did what I thought best. You mean to say you believe in a stupid superstition? You mean you murdered the woman because of... Because of... I came out here to this tree with Alice, Mr. Thorpe. You did? And I knew Francis was here, too. He's here now. You're... You saw him, didn't you? The man you thought was waiting for the bus? I... Here, where are you going? I threw away a flower from his grave here a year ago. Now, here's your flower, Alice. I kept my promise, dear. Alice and Francis, together now, forever. You don't believe that. Listen. Thank you to our wonderful performers and to our brilliant production manager, Barb Shoulders, and to you, our audience. We hope you enjoyed the show. Stay tuned for the second half of our doubleheader, Don't Tell Me About Halloween. You know what they say about a woman scorned. What if she's a witch? That show is coming up at nine o'clock, and we have two more doubleheaders next week. So tune back in and shh. Thank you.